morning, everyone. Uh, this is Milar speaking from the very heart of Turkey. It's a great pleasure to have you with us for today's Union Symposium, Geosciences and United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, Pathways for the Future. We are a group of early career scientists organizing this uh, symposium and the idea was around since 2018 summer. Luckily, we had the chance to do it this year under these circumstances, but nothing can stop us. So um, we hope that you will enjoy uh, the presentations and the discussion in the final part. We have three featured speakers, um, Stefan Fritz, uh, Giuliano Di Baldassare, and Kansuke Fukushi. Um, so the main idea was to have um, a platform where primarily early career scientists have uh, have a chance to uh, discuss what's happening regarding the United Nations 2030 agenda for uh, sustainable development. Uh, which is covered by the 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. And as geoscientists, we believe that um, the role of uh, the science itself together with how this science is communicated uh, or produced in, in the first place, how it is designed is uh, important and today through the talks we would like you to have an impression of how uh, the research is doing to address SDGs. There are different aspects to it but mainly um, uh, we have we will have three main uh, highlights. Um, so you might want to uh, ask questions so you will have the chance to uh, share your questions throughout the symposium through the uh, questions and answers box uh, if you drop in your questions in the chat box we might not able to see them so please make sure that uh, you drop them in the q a box um, so just want to share my view on, on the SDGs. So the planet Earth is sick, so to say. If we consider it uh, like a living being, it's, uh, it has some health problems and SDGs are like the prescription that we have at the moment, uh, led by the UN. And scientists are part of the recovery part and have a role to uh, heal the planet for um, for a for a long term. Okay, so uh, now I would like to give the floor to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Stephen Fritz from um, International Institute Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. Uh, ecosystem services and management program of which he is the program director. Uh, he is joining us from Austria, Luxembourg, and he is the leader of the Earth Observation and Citizen Science. Uh, he has in, been involved in many um, ERC H2020 projects. Um, regarding citizen science and today in his talk he's going to share his uh, insights on how citizen science can um, help to address SDGs mainly through the throughout the monitoring uh, reporting process. So thanks for your attention and now the floor is yours Stefan. Thank you very much. Um, just going to get up, share, share my presentation with you. Um, let's 
getting into presentation mode. I guess um, you all you all can sh can see my screen. Um, I guess it's working. Um, I would like to thank you very much for inviting me to give this this talk to you. Um, as you have already described it very well, the, the planet is sick. Um, we all agree on that. And it is the future generations who will suffer most. And just to get it now in the context of the current COVID crisis we are in, uh, countries are going into big depths. And it's again the, the future generations who will have to pay that depth. So just to put it in the context of what's currently going on and why we are talking to each other remotely. Um, this work has been also um, prepared and has been carried out partly uh, by uh, also a young, a young scientist, uh, early career scientist, sorry, um, Dilek Freisel, um, and, and a number of many other people who have been, been involved in this work. Um, just to get you a bit into the context um, of where I see this kind of a very interesting triangle. So in order to improve um, what's currently going on and to heal our planet, as you have said, we need new policies, we need aggressive policies, we need policies which really target um, what's currently wrong with our planet. Um, and this need to be uh, policies in the different fields. Um, you can see it here, energy policies, land use policies, water policies, um, and in order to improve those policies and to give advice how these policies should be set up um, and designed, we need modeling tools, we need science which provides uh, uh, information and gives policy advice, but at the same time we also need to understand if the policy is actually working, if the policy is doing the job it's supposed to do, for that, we need very strong monitoring components. And this mon monitoring is traditionally coming from the statistical offices. It's traditionally coming from some kind of sampling design, um, census, uh, many other uh, questionnaires, household surveys, and so forth. But there is a new potential now with new technologies, with big data, and with, with citizen science to also contribute to, to monitoring this um, SDG. So when you are sick and you are uh, um, going to the doctor, the doctor uh, measures your temperature. Um, so this is just one uh, symbolism which we can use that it's really important to understand uh, where we are. Um, are we going into the right direction? Are we getting more sick or are at least we're getting less sick? And is the planet getting less sick in the different areas? That's, I think, important. Um, just to move now, changing gears a bit here, to the different ways of how SDGs can be monitored. Um, uh, as you can see here, we, as I have already described, we have the traditional data sources for SDG monitoring, which are national statistical offices uh, are doing that job. But there is much more data out there. They are big commercial providers. As we know, Google has a lot of data, uh, has actually very interesting data, which could be made uh, more available, not just to people who pay for it, but potentially also to the UN. Donating data, I think, is a very important uh, topic these days, um, where people are also asked to donate, maybe in the future now, starting from now, their personal data where they have been, and maybe if they have been uh, in contact with people who have the coronavirus, just as one example. Um, donating data, I think, is a big thing in the future. We need to tap into more. And then we have many other uh, very new innovative ways of collecting data. We have sensors, we have big sensor networks. People have wearables around their uh, pulse uh, uh, and, and uh, around their arm wrists collecting data. We have many different passive sources. Uh, also social media can monitor where we are going. Sentiment analysis is a big topic. And we have the, the citizen generated data, such as, for example, 
um, humanitarian open street map data, uh, uh, but also open street map data as such. We have big database, spatial data infrastructures of different countries, open data also partly in some countries, um, e-governance and open data being a big topic. And we have Earth Observation providing also more and more free and open data, especially the European uh, Copernicus pro, uh, uh, program now providing data um, on a 10 meter resolution every five days, for example. And that is amazing. That really helps us a lot to better understand what's happening with our planet in terms of the environment in particular. Um, we have the sustainable development goals and I think you are all familiar with them and I don't think I have to go more into detail here. Um, I just want to pick some examples now. Um, we have, of course, uh, the, the traditional sources uh, of data, um, but also um, if we tap into these new data sources, we get more information about where are the problems. So the statistical data just tells us, you know, where we are going in terms of direction in the different countries, but we are not understanding really where the problems are exactly in those countries and that is i think very important um, and citizen science also has a big contribution to be made in that which i will want to go into more detail in that respect but just to flag a little bit uh, the earth observation data so there are a lot of activities currently going on but one very nice example is um, the water occurrence explorer that is run by the joint research center of the european commission uh, you can see the logo also in this slide and that is measuring directly sdg 6.6.1 which is um, how water bodies are developing now over time in the next years if they are disappearing if they are changing if large reservoirs are um, established and what the impacts are of those um, and as we know 6.6.1 is one of the indicators so if water occurrence increases that's in general more a good sign if it decreases that's more a, a bad sign or not so good sign in general but there are many nuances to this and we have to not forget those nuances um, another one is unlit building footprint. So Earth Observation has now really interesting means to map built up areas. And you can now check, is this built up area lit or is it not lit? Um, if it's lit up, that's quite a lot happening in the Western world, in, in Europe, in, in the US and many other countries. Um, it's lit up. It, it means that it has electricity when the building is mapped by remote sensing but not lit so these are nighttime lights we are using for that then there are real issues and this can give you a very interesting poverty indicator so whereas this is aggregated now on a national level you can then zoom in in those countries which are currently red here where there is very little lit up uh, buildings uh, um, especially in africa as you can see you can zoom into those places and you can find out which which current buildings are not lit and there is an issue clearly there in particular with, with electricity supply so this is another um, sustainable development goal to supply people with uh, with electricity uh, uh, clean water uh, and and many others uh, 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 but of course that is a big thing because in those places people are still heating with charcoal for example and as we know charcoal is creating a lot of air pollution and a lot of premature deaths, for example, uh, are attributed to, to uh, heating and, 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 and uh, uh, with coal, coal-based uh, uh, charcoal, for example, as well. Um, just to bring you back to the interface between Earth observation and citizen science now. So um, where citizen science also can contribute a lot to, to actually Earth observation is uh, with respect to reference data, in situ data. So there are a lot of um, machine learning algorithms now coming out, um, um, which manage to classify uh, remotely sense-based data. But if you don't have enough training data um, and not enough so-called reference data, then you cannot produce very good uh, remotely sense-based products. So for that, 
you need a lot of data collected potentially on the ground and citizens can play a very big role in that, um, especially in the field of land cover, land use related uh, 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 monitoring aspects. Mm. We at our institute also at Yaza have uh, designed some of those tools, one being picture pile, another one uh, being PhotoQuest Go, and that there is the Earth Challenge and the Earth Challenge Network being currently extremely active. So if you have a question on the Earth Challenge Network, just send me an email. I will get you in touch with the uh, with with the people and also with the websites you need to maybe you want to get yourself involved in that. We're also running there one specific uh, theme, which is on food security, where this is illustrated how. Um, reference data you can all classify in your room. If you're not allowed to go out during COVID, you can do a lot of work also in your room classifying um, classifying street view or, or street level photography, uh, which can be crops uh, to collect more reference data to make better maps of, of crops, such as wheat and maize, for example, very important globally. Good wheat and maize uh, maps are essential um, in order to understand better food security related uh, issues and to provide early warning in those countries where there are uh, droughts. Currently we have a drought uh, uh, in some places over Europe, interestingly. So in, for that we need very good crop specific maps that we know ahead which crops might be affected. Uh, and this is even more important in developing countries um, such as Malawi, for example, where most of the crops are actually maize, uh, 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 staple crops in particular. Um, other activities, um, and I think I have to slowly come to an end that we have still room for questions, uh, where citizen science can also contribute a lot to monitoring of the SDGs, is in the field of marine plastic. Coastal activities are going on and you can then follow a protocol which then um, can compare different uh, uh, amounts of plastic along the, the coast, following a protocol that you can also compare countries, how they are doing with respect to, to coastal um, plastic pollution, but also a lot of plastic is of course in the sea and that also needs to be monitored that there are new devices which we need to de design to be able to also quantify the, the, the marine litter as such floating inside the ocean. But if you have a handle on the coast, you do co counts of those along the coast, you can already get a little bit of a understanding if it's increasing or decreasing and you have to do this regular. Uh, and there's a lot of very interesting citizen science activities going on in particular in New Zealand, for example, they have designed a very interesting protocol on how to do that. Um, so there are also um, COP communities of practice with respect to citizen science and we are running a project currently, a European funded project called We Observe. You saw the logo at the beginning of the slide and that We Observe project has so-called communities of practice and in that community of practice, um, Dilek Frazel, who is very active in that field, is discussing different ways how citizen science can contribute to, to, con to measure and monitor, uh, but also to achieve the SDGs. Um, so this is uh, the activity ongoing and there's a lot of research which this group has also been undertaking. Um, that's under review at the moment, but I will nevertheless show very few slides on that. Um, this is the definition of, of citizen science. Um, um, it's around public participation, voluntary contribution, and in particular, uh, knowledge production. Um, I'm not going here into detail because there is not much time left, I'm afraid. Um, but what is interesting and what's coming out of this research is that citizen science is already contributing a lot to monitoring the SDGs, in particular, um, for example, around what OpenStreetMap has been doing um, for example, people living in areas um, within a two kilometer radius to current 
um, roads, uh, which can be used the whole year. And that's a very important indicator because it shows how well people are actually connected to each other and, and can be accessing also global markets. It's a very important indicator also for development, for example. Um, so that is very interesting. And another interesting indicator uh, is around biodiversity. There's lots of bird counts, a lot of biodiversity observations and species observation going on through iNaturally, through eBird, um, and that's already contributing a lot to um, SDGs uh, around biodiversity, um, for example. Um, SDG 15 in particular, as you can see here, uh, there are these green fields. Um, when there is a box, a black box around it, this is are the SDGs where Earth observation and citizen science can contribute uh, to that specific indicator. Uh, so indicators are a, a way of measuring uh, progress towards SDGs. And there are, um, I think, now around 169, but they keep changing and being adopted. Um, I think I will stop here that we have some, some time for questions. Thank you very much. I, I stopped sharing, I guess, right? Yep. Dear Stefan, thanks for sharing your insights. Um, we had we heard a lot about what's going on indeed regarding Earth observations with respect to how these observations help to uh, monitor different uh, indicators. There are many of them. So uh, I think we haven't received a question yet, but just to make use of the, the remaining two minutes left, I would like to ask a question, and I'm sure this is uh, one uh, many people are wondering. So citizen science has a great value, right? We acknowledge it, we see it, it's already contributing, as you said, but what about the quality of the data? Yes. Um, it's it's good because the data can be collected quickly and uh, so much data, especially by the citizens. But when it comes to its quality, how can we make sure that the validity of these data can indeed be justified? Yeah. That's a very important question you are asking indeed. Um, that is the crux of citizen science data indeed. Um, so there are certain ways how you can guarantee a certain level of, of, of quality. So one thing which citizen science is doing a lot is multiple observations. That's also what iNaturalist is doing. So you, it's not just one person, it's at least two people telling the same thing. So that increases the confidence. But there are also other ways like, um, you know, if people are not serious, you can, you can find about, out about that. You can overlay data with other sources of data and then you know that this person is maybe not serious. And then another aspect is of course, training and, and um, you know, letting people really know what you are after and providing really good protocols and training programs on how to best do things and also making them understand what is done with the data. So this is the communication uh, uh, element. Um, and then you can also do some automatic uh, text tests of, of quality um, um, that these are, I think, currently the means uh, 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 used to, to make sure certain quality is, is guaranteed. But then, of course, you still have to fight uh, against this general precedent uh, prejudice against citizen science that they will always say you know but still it's not good enough it's not uh, representative so you can try to do something on representativeness of the samplings as well you can sub-select certain things and make it more statistically relevant so these are the things you you, you can do uh, 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 around the, the quality and and around this this criticism of of not having enough quality but thanks for this very important question. Yes, um, that's a good answer. And um, thanks for your um, presentation. If you have more stuff to say, we still have uh, three minutes 
Um, we do have other questions if you wanna uh, answer shortly. Um, some people are, uh, some scientists here are asking, how do you standardize data, uh, especially from citizen sciences approach? Yeah, that's another, that's another good question. <laughs> um, so one thing you can of course do, it depends a lot on your citizen science project. So it depends a lot on the purpose. So a lot of citizen science projects are indeed very local. Um, what you can then try to do is to work with these local existing um, communities and make them aware about the need to standardize. If they understand the need of to standardize, you can potentially at a second level which is harmonized and standardized globally, but you will have to work very closely with this existing local uh, project. So that, that is key. And, and, it, and then you can of course try to do some standardization by understanding the semantics and the meaning of how the data is collected, what it is, and maybe sometimes it fits in some kind of standard uh, uh, approach, but also what you can also do if you set up new projects, you can already follow this kind of standardized, harmonized global protocol, um, making sure from the beginning that it's standardized. These are, I think, the different approaches you can take. And um, thank you very much. And in this regard, uh, another scientist is asking, um, as you know, there have been so many criticism about the so many indicators that have been used for the SDGs. So how can geoscientists um, manage, organize, and collect data to be meaningful to the policy uh, agenda for the SDGs? Yeah, it is a lot of indicators and you know it's, it's so many indicators because the, the, the SDGs are trying to capture everything. It captures the economy and it captures the health of the planet together and, and that is extremely challenging and that's why we have so many indicators. Um, of course, what we might try to do at some point is to think if there cannot be some simplified versions of these indicators, which are kind of summarizing them in, in one way or another, and maybe there needs to be more work done uh, just to weight them differently. Because some indicators, I would say, might be less important than others, might be. That, that there can be a lot of discussion and it's very controversial, but uh, some kind of simplification process uh, it would maybe help in, in, in this process. But on the other hand, also I think a lot is also around awareness raising from the beginning. You know, if school children start to be familiar with all of this and with all the indicators and are educated from the beginning, I think it's much easier for people then to grasp the complexity of, of all these indicators. Uh, don't know if this answers the question. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Either in um, some other scientists as a, as a, are asking how the social media can boost awareness or participation for t citizen science. And I think is, is what you already said. So we need to start increasing the interest on SDGs, the importance of collecting data, and, mm. and so I mean, I mean, maybe just one more point since you're all young uh, career researchers. I think one thing which might be good to do is to we have so many SDGs, but some of them they can be also simplified into the big global transformations we need. So there are certain big global transformations we need with respect to economy, for example, circular economy, shared economy. Um, you know things which are related very much to the econom economic part and the transformations we need, this, these are the questions we need to ask. And if we can orient ourselves along those transformations, we are also much more, we are met better equipped to understand what we need to measure. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the questions. I, ju I just would like to remind you that you need to drop in your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat box, okay? So thanks for your uh, cooperation. So now it's time for uh, the next presentation by Giuliano Di Baldassare, joining us from Uppsala, Sweden. He's a professor in the Department of Earth Sciences of Uppsala University. 
He is also a professor of hydrology and environmental analysis at CNDC, Center of Natural Hazards and Disaster Science. Um, he has been uh, very active uh, in the field of hydrology, particularly social hydrology, and he is currently leading uh, an ERC project on hydrosocial extremes where he investigates uh, the interactions between the society and uh, hydrology. Uh, without further delay, I would like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Giuliano. Thanks, and uh, thanks everyone uh, uh, for uh, the invitation to this nice session about geoscience and uh, sustainable development goals. I would like also to um, uh, say good morning and hi to uh, 300 plus people that are attending this session. It's very odd not to see you into your eyes, uh, but um, uh, it's nice to see such a large participation. Uh, so I will now move to uh, the presentation by sharing my screen. And uh, uh, so as um, it was already introduced um, by the chairperson, uh, I will um, be speaking about uh, the way in which uh, social hydrology uh, can help address the global water crisis and meet the sustainable development goals. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the many co-authors of this study that I'm going to present, uh, which um, are um, uh, mainly uh, social scientists as well as hydrological scientists in many places around the world. Humanity is facing a, a global water crisis. Uh, this global water crisis is increasing in its complexity and uh, it is often uh, uh, the uh, result of a complex web of interactions between social, technical and uh, hydrological factors. We carried out uh, recently um, a survey across water scientists and experts at the AGU conference in, um, uh, that at that time was um, in uh, New Orleans and the IHS uh, conference, which is the uh, International Association of Hydrological Sciences. And, um, and we have seen that in many places around the world, we have ongoing water crisis, which ranges from ecological degradation, increasing flood risk to uh, groundwater depletion. And um, we ask experts to look into the main factors that are driving this crisis. And what we can see uh, on the right hand side of the slide is that these factors ranges from physical, technical and uh, social aspects. And this is also why the International Association of Hydrological Sciences has been launching a, a research decade called Panther Ray, which is focusing on the interactions between hydrology and society. There is nothing new about uh, trying to understand the relationship between water and people if we think that already 2,500 years ago, Heraclitus, uh, to express the concept that nothing is permanent except change, is actually referring to the relationship between water and people. He said that no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it is not the same river and is not the same man. And what we have uh, nowadays, we have hundreds of water scientists that are involved in many uh, working groups in uh, Pantore, and I know that uh, many of you are working on these groups and uh, trying to better understand the way in which hydrology and society shape each other. So we see that uh, in the Anthropocene, uh, we can very dif it's very dif difficult to find uh, places which are not affected by the presence of humans. And in particular, when it comes to hydrology or the spatial temporal distribution of water resources, we see that humans have heavily altered the hydrological regime. Such an alteration is both deliberate, uh, this is one of the goals, for instance, uh, in the uh, building of water infrastructure or some risk reduction measures to mitigate floods or droughts can aim to change the hydrological regime or accidental. Uh, we have urbanization, deforestation, other types of land use changes that also have an influence on the hydrological regime. And while society shapes the hydrology, hydrology in its turn shapes society. Humans respond to hydrological change in many different ways. It could be formally, uh, for instance, by implementing conservation measures. 
if we look into this slide, for instance, we have a diagram in which we can see uh, how water consumption in the city of Cape Town in South Africa has been affected by a prolonged drought in the period 2015, 2017. And we can also see that different social groups have had a different impact, uh, have been impacted differently uh, by the occurrence of droughts. And also we have more, more informal type of response to hydrological change. We have migration, we have the emergence of conflicts or so cooperation uh, around uh, water resources. And this is one of the main goals of social hydrology, trying to understand how this mutual shaping between hydrology and society can generate phenomena, phenomena that characterize may, uh, the water crisis and the way we can deal with that. So hydrology is building on a long history of studying water and people. Uh, as I said before, this started already with Heraclitus 2,500 years ago. But if we look into, into uh, modern science, uh, the uh, hydrology is building on water resources systems, integrated water resources management, social ecological systems, as well as the study of couple human nature systems. And, um, and the, the reason why we want to understand these phenomena is that because they can prevent uh, the, uh, uh, they can prevent us addressing the global water crisis. There are some measures that we put in place that can have unintended effect, which are opposite to what we see. And um, in social hydrology, many phenomena have been described. Uh, we have supply demand cycles. For instance, we could have reservoirs that are put in place uh, to cope with scarce water availability. But that's this, the presence of these reservoirs can also worsen water shortages as their presence may uh, favor and uh, enable increasing water demand until the next uh, uh, drought occurs and damages are even increased because we have more, uh, more heavy dependence on water resources. We have rebound effects, when, uh, uh, which is the case in which more efficient irrigation uh, may uh, facilitate and encourage additional agricultural intensification and lead to even increasing water consumption. Another paradox is the safe development paradox or levy effect, when increasing level of protections can, can uh, uh, stimulate urbanization of risky areas such as floodplains and increase the damage. Or maladaptation effect, when the response to droughts may exacerbate uh, the impact of floods or vice versa. So the, the idea in social hydrology is trying to understand this phenomena. And this is done through case studies in which we look into the different type of mechanism as well as models, but models not with the, with the goal of making quantitative predictions, but rather to trying to understand and explain past changes of droughts and flood risk and explore future trade-off. So here in this slide, we have an example of a of a model that was developed a few years ago uh, by our research group in which we have been focusing on human flood interactions and the way in which flood risk changes over time. In our simple model, uh, we made the fundamental assumption that flood memory is a primary mechanism which can explain the emergence of certain phenomena. For instance, the uh, in introducing uh, structural protection measures that prevent frequent flooding uh, can uh, reduce flood memory and uh, uh, produce more incentives to urbanize floodplain areas and therefore put more people at risk. We see the role of memory, by the way, also in uh, these days, and we can discuss this later, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, emergence of the corona crisis. A lot of attention is nowadays on the COVID-19. And this has put many societies to prioritize the response to COVID-19 um, while maybe underestimating other sources of risk that we are facing in the meantime. In this type of model, I'm not gonna give details, but uh, the essence of this model is, um, uh, could, could, is to try to understand how different responses can generate different trajectories of risk. 
And um, uh, for instance, in a classical experiment that was um, uh, broadly discussed in the hydrological community, we compare two idealized or stylized type of system, a grid system which deals with floods uh, mainly by uh, resettlement and a technical system which is building also uh, some levees to protect flood prone areas. And um, in a, what we, 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 we show is that in a, in a green system, we have a, the, the flood memory is refreshed uh, often. And uh, we also see the emergence of adaptation effect in the sense that um, this continuous refreshment of flood memory makes people aware of flood risk and take therefore uh, less um, risk and don't settle too much into floodplain areas or take other precautions. On the other side, the technical system has the advantage of preventing many flood events, al allowing uh, urbanization of the floodplain, but the cost is that uh, when a flood occurs, the damage is extremely big and catastrophic. The key question is, is not whether a green system is better of a technical system or vice versa. The key question is about trade-off. And this is kind of the, my keyword for today's talk. So the trade-off are very relevant when we look about uh, when we look at sustainable development goals. Also, before we were discussing about the fact that we have main indicators, uh, because we with the sustainable development goals, the uh, United Nations and uh, many countries are mobilizing resources to uh, to look into the different factors uh, related to our well-being. So we have social, economic, and environmental factors. And many of these sustainable development goals are related to water resources, not only the number six, which is related to clean water and sanitation, but also many other uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, here we can see, for instance, in this, uh, in this diagram, uh, some of the SDGs that are uh, most uh, uh, associated uh, with the SDG, uh, with, uh, with, with water, and um, uh, since it is difficult to look into uh, all, those, uh, all those diagrams, I will focus on the way in which some of these SDGs can, um, the trade-off between these SDGs can be uh, tackled only if we understand uh, uh, social hydrological phenomena. And since I made the sample of the safe development paradox and uh, flood risk, I will focus on this phenomena and some SDGs in particular to sustain uh, per capita economic growth and uh, uh, the, uh, as well as the 11, which is to reduce that from water-related disasters and, and then the 13, which is strengthening resilience to climate-related uh, hazard. What we can see here is uh, uh, the trajectory of wealth over time, which is simulated by social hydrological models. We see the green line, which is a green system. You can see over the years, many, uh, we, have a, we have a growing wealth, which is interrupted by flood losses in time. These flood losses are very little. If we look into the technical system, which is the red line, we see that economic growth or, or the, the growth of wealth is much, more, much faster. But at the same time, the, when the flood occurs, which is more rare, but when it occurs, it has very big losses. So what these models can allow us is to explore the trade-off. For instance, this blue line in which we have a trade-off between using structural and non-structural measures to deal with flood risk and also to address the different sustainable development goals. For instance, in this case, a trade-off between economic growth and saving and reducing death uh, from water-related hazards. For the sake of simplicity, I only show two uh, SDGs, but this can be applied to multiple, uh, to multiple uh, SDGs. So the, 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 key, uh, the key goal uh, if, to address uh, the SDGs is to, uh, is to better understand uh, the way in which our policies have an influence on water resources, including the unintended effect, especially when on the short and the long term. Here we, uh, this is why in, uh, in our paper um, that I will present uh, later, we introduce the concept of legacy risk. Because what we do today uh, will influence uh, what we can actually do in the, in the past. 
So as the past was a legacy to the present, the present is a legacy for the future. I will explain this uh, by using a very uh, simple diagram in which I make the assumption that we have two alternative policies. A policy, uh, which I call short-term policy, uh, that you can see in this diagram uh, with a, a dark red uh, line, and a long-term policy, uh, which we can see in this diagram in, a, in something which is between blue and green. Um, and then we can think about the performance in, uh, uh, in addressing the SDGs uh, over time. So this performance could be, a, uh, could be the combination of different SDGs and how they are, are addressed by different policies. So if we were only focusing on 2030, we would go for the short-term policy. So trying to, to get as close as possible to our target by 2030. But what we can see with this example is that short-term policy can have a very bad impacts on the long term. So maybe a long term policy would be, uh, would be a, a most appropriate one. And this is what this type of models can try to help, trying to make us look beyond short term, um, short term objectives. We see this also happening right now with the Corona crisis. The big questions that many countries are facing, to what extent we can uh, fight the virus without compromising the future of our country. And this is what we do on water resources as well. I make a more precise example in these two diagrams. In a short-term policy, which is here on the left-hand side, we see that uh, we have that two type of uh, indicators. For the sake of simplicity, I keep on focusing only on two of them. One is the real GDP per capita, and the second one is the extent of water-related ecosystems. We could have a policy which is increasing real GDP per capita, that we see that is increasing quite, uh, quite uh, rapidly. And, but this goes at the expense of the ecosystem. So if we see the composite performance, which result by the combination of the, two, of the two indicators, we have a growing up to a certain time, but then when the environment is degraded, we also have a declining GDP, and the system may collapse. On the other side, we have a long-term policy, uh, which is, uh, in which we have a more sustainable, uh, more sustainable um, uh, development in which GDP is growing not that fast as in the other case, uh, but the water-related ecosystems are protected. And uh, this is the type of uh, uh, analysis that we can do when we understand uh, the interactions between human society and water resources. Uh, the key goal is to try to avoid short-term fixes that can backfire in the long run. So this, uh, this is the conclusion of my talk, uh, which was very much about trying to understand a model, the trade-off between different sustainable development goals with a focus on uh, the ones that are water-related, since we are facing a very complex and multifaceted global water crisis. The importance of considering economic, social, and environmental consequences, both the intended and the unintended, and trying to avoid short-term solutions that can have negative consequences in the long term. And the other aspect is also that social hydrology is aiming more and more to also understand the uneven distribution of cost and benefit across different social groups. I leave with this last slide um, in which uh, I advertise the paper in which you can read more about, uh, about the way in which uh, our understanding of human water interactions can help us address uh, the global water crisis. Thank you. Thanks, Giuliano, uh, for this very uh, excellent presentation covering a wide range of uh, topics which uh, I hope made us all expand our uh, thinking when it comes to water-related SDGs, which is not only a few, but many. Um, as you mentioned, the global water crisis is ongoing and it's not gonna be better soon, but with the hope that uh, uh, the social hydrology research coming into the picture 
um, we will see progress. Um, there is a flood of questions uh, regarding the first presentation, but uh, for now, I would like to give the floor to Julia Roder to uh, lead us maybe uh, like one question we can get if there is any at the moment, but we will get them at the end of the talks. Julia? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, there is one, but um, it's kind of a bit far from uh, SDGs and your talk, so maybe I will address it later. So uh, I have a question, a very quick one. So as I understand, uh, social natural systems are quite dynamic, as you said. Do you think that um, the political uh, committees or politicians that has a very big turnover sometimes can uh, keep track in their policies and how they can do long-term policies in light of their, you know, uh, big change uh, over time and how just scientists can follow because we are working at a different time scale. So policymakers, natural uh, systems and uh, scientists. Uh, thanks, Julia. This is, a, this is a nice question. And uh, as you can imagine, we can speak for hours about this topic since it's very key. And I see that uh, in the chat, uh, there are uh, three, uh, two, three questions about, you know, the fact that indeed we would like to, to have a long-term horizon, but uh, uh, politicians, national, national gov governments are often uh, uh, focusing on the short-term solution. And uh, the reason is that, um, well, there is a human reason uh, politicians want to be re-elected at the next mandate. Uh, we have elections every four or five years. So hopefully there is a wishful thinking. Uh, they hope that maybe the big disaster will not occur during that period. And therefore, um, uh, there is less investment on uh, uh, long-term policies, for instance, for the protection of the environment, uh, uh, to deal with climate change, and also to tackle uh, some uh, prolonged water crisis. What we can do as scientists, still, we, there is a lot we can do. Uh, it was already mentioned before, what, it is important to raise awareness on this topic because at the end of the day, it's the general public is, is convinced by the fact that we need to look, you know, we need, we need this uh, long-term perspective. Then I think that also politicians will be uh, pushed to consider that more and more. So this is this is the my brief uh, my brief answer to that. But of course, it's very complex, and uh, and there could be also other aspects. Uh, education is indeed a, a, it it is a, a key role uh, to that. Thanks, Giuliano. We will get back to you in the discussion part with more interesting questions. Now uh, we are moving to our last speaker. Uh, Dr. Kansuke Fukushi from University of Tokyo uh, within Institute for Future Initiatives. He is also affiliated with uh, the United Nations University as an academic program officer at the Institute for the Advanced Study of Sustainability. Uh, he is a civil environmental engineer uh, who is uh, very motivated to uh, promote sustain sustainability science in various academic communities. And today he's gonna talk about uh, the role and value of water uh, for the sustainable development of Asian cities. Dr. Kansuke. Um. For me, it's a good evening. I'm speaking from Tokyo, uh, which is still uh, locked down our next one month, uh, unfortunately. So I'm delivering, you know, all kind of the lecture meeting from from my room. It's like a YouTuber. Um, I'm very happy to attend their EGU meeting, um, which is successfully uh, held through uh, this new technology. Are, I congratulate everybody uh, who can gather here in the cyberspace. Uh, today's my talk is uh, one of uh, uh, several uh, things that I'm talking things, but uh, mainly I talk about in Asian case, which has a little bit different situation with uh, other European and African uh, cases. 
this is a, a, a cities. A majority of their uh, cities is going to be uh, located in in their Asia uh, after, for next century. Uh, Sixty percent of the population is going to be accumulated in Asia, and fortunately, unfortunately, um, most of our city is located in their coastal area. It's very natural. We are rice eaters. Uh, rice in the past is a very labor intensive uh, agriculture, and they need to grow on the flat land. Flat land is on the, the coastal barrier. Uh, of course, you know, there's a lot of round rock country like Nepal, but there still, and you know, we have a major uh, big cities in located in the flat area in the coastal city, which is generally in very vulnerable against the water. Um, six, uh, since 60% you know, of the population is in, in, there, uh, in Asia, and 70% uh, of uh, people out of uh, that 60% will be look at, accumulated in the urban place. And of course, you know, one person in created what, uh, 40 gram of bio biochemical action demand um, that create the pollution. Uh, we need water, but we don't want to have a polluted water. Pollut polluted water does not have value or even negative value. Flooding, uh, we have in the uh, previous speaker, we talk about flooding. Of course, in the flooding is a never ending story. It is a, uh, in, in the South Asian situation, but in Japan, we also still have a flooding, uh, different kind of flooding. Uh, it's coming in a very short time and, 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 and destroy everything and leave in a very short time. But uh, many Asian country is fighting with flooding, uh, but at the same time, there is some city is still dealing with kind of frequent flood, but not much big disaster. However, this city is rapidly changing in order to uh, prevent water engineer in, in from the engineering sense of view. Uh, but again, you know, uh, they might experience the large uh, disaster in their near future uh, because of their uh, expectation or design of their, that kind of their uh, environmental infrastructure, sometimes they're below uh, their, uh, their real situation and their climate change situation. And of course, you know, this is Manila. Uh, it's vulnerable. I mean, their, our, our urban area have a, uh, not only just their, you know, having their a decent, you know, uh, living situation, but the many of them, uh, and uh, and and not small man of the land is occupied, so-called uh, informal settlers. Um, this is a, you know, I mean, the informal settler we call non-engineered house, uh, which they built every every seven years. So they have they can adapt to climate change <laughs> every seven years. However, yeah, you know, this height of the you know floor cannot extend, you know. <laughs> There are some limit. Um, of course, it, I'm joking. This, um, you know, uh, city or urban uh, uh, and water and people, uh, you know, having a lot of the relationship is actually entire uh, goals of sustainable development goals. And this is a, I just to pick up. You know, this is a very qualitative uh, analysis. That the things keyword that pick up come to my mind. I just put throw it in the figure. However, it has a lot of the relation, but there's a lot of the uh, opportunity and the world uh, for uh, people and as well as for investors. There's a lot of the uh, chance for the investment from the uh, in many sectors uh, in order to mitigate, in order to supply uh, water. It's, I mean, very um, uh, surprising that, you know, it's already several, you know, I mean, there's 96, which means there's four years has passed since last habitat, you know, being held in Quito. Uh, and I, I attended this and uh, out of this habitat tree, uh, we adopt the new urban agenda, uh, which is right after, one year after this, uh, the, the adoption of the SDGs. And it has uh, uh, several uh, fact places that emphasize related to water uh, and that the transformative commitment of the equitative and affordable access and uh, uh, adverse impact of the water uh, has well, uh, and sustainable use of water. 
and of course, you know, effective implementation of the uh, in uh, in urban area of the water uh, promotion, adequate investment on the water, equip public water and sanitation uh, utilities is very important. Of course, in the SDGs, uh, you know, centered uh, in, in in goal six. Of course, in this uh, goal three, goal eleven, and. As I shown in the previous slide, other uh, all other uh, goals is also related to the uh, water area. A problem on water in developing uh, urban cities in general, uh, especially in Asian city, water shortage uh, um, by human activity. Uh, human has accumulated in in the area uh, of the uh, urban area, and one person. Uh, in Tokyo, we use 200 liter of water per day, um, and uh, for poor people in in in, in poor country, utilizing between 15 and 100 liter of water per day. And, uh, however, uh, as course of the economical development, uh, uh, the amount of water they use is going to be larger. Uh, shortage in urban water supply. Uh, we have. In, uh, in, in Asia, we have an average of two meters uh, of the precipitation yearly. However, in urban area, because of the so many uh, people living there, in very small scale, we get short of water. Uh, loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services, and damage of water uh, landscaping. This is uh, also very uh, important uh, things uh, from the viewpoint of the uh, high quality of living quality, uh, living environment, and water degradation by human activity. Uh, I say that we use a 200, few hundred liter per a person per uh, day water, but this water is uh, emitted from human activity with pollutant. So uh, unable uh, to use water, polluted water is, is no value or, or negative value. Somebody have to clean up that water uh, in order to discharge uh, to the environment properly. And if we don't have a, a good amount of water uh, and bad quality of water, there is no biodiversity. Yeah, there is biodiversity of anaerobic microorganisms, but we don't have, you know, I mean, the original, we lose, uh, we, we, we lose the original uh, ecosystem uh, which was located there. All the landscape damage, is of course, in addition to the uh, damage of landscaping. Uh, look at this picture. It's very dirty uh, water. Uh, guess where is this? Uh, this is uh, uh, in Tokyo, 1970s, which is a 40, uh, no, it's already 50 years ago. <laughs> Time passes really quick. Uh, this is worse than Jakarta. This is worse than Hanoi. And uh, most of the Asian city is better than this. Just 50 years ago, uh, we, we, our water environment is like this. I was 10 years old uh, at that time. And population with water supply in, and sewage in, in Tokyo, uh, we have uh, water supply, sewage, total population is almost saturated, almost 100% of the water supply and, and, and sewage uh, coverage. And of course, in our population is kind of it's almost flat. Um, now it's a, our uh, water environment look like this. Of course, you know, uh, from the viewpoint of landscaping, I don't know, I'm urban engineer, but uh, I'm environmental, I'm not urban planner. So, but as a citizen, I don't really appreciate this kind of, you know, I mean, the uh, landscaping. However, from the viewpoint of water quality, uh, you can see fish is as if, I mean, they're uh, swimming in, the, in, in this uh, water. This water is, I mean, the irritably, clean, uh, if you think of the density of the people living here, it's amazingly clean. But we have to also know, uh, majority of the water body in the urban, urban river in Tokyo is treated wastewater. Uh, first, uh, in wastewater treatment in Tokyo was uh, is built in 1922, uh, which is almost 100 years ago. Um, we have 13 uh, major uh, water treat wastewater treatment plant is almost all of them are, are active as such, uh, which consume huge amount of energy in order to clean water. If you see the Yanagibashi Bridge, 95.9%, uh, depending on season, of course, uh, is a treated wastewater. In the case of the uh, Jakarta, which is uh, wastewater coverage, it's only 2%. 
uh, is this uh, blue uh, part is untreated wastewater, which has a um, like a 400 milligram per liter of the bio biochemical oxygen demand. That is a, a zero uh, or dissolved oxygen in it. High energy demand technology. Application of such technology would exceed the planetary boundary from the viewpoint of the various things, uh, re energy resources. Um, our current um, society is based on the assumption that we have cheap fossil fuel, which is no longer apply. Uh, our, uh, we have to change it. Uh, currently now the most cheapest energy source is solar energy. I mean, there, <laughs> but you know, I just uh, have to see their micro movers, you know, new uh, movie, which have, I have not chance to get a chance to see it. But uh, we have to reframe the entire society. Oops. Uh, this is one of the, our project results. This is a projection of the urban flooding. Uh, in the future, uh, we will have a urban, um, I mean, the, uh, urban flooding if we do not implement the 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 uh, master plan of Jakarta properly, and this is actually interesting. You know, many people project uh, flooding in the future, but we also project uh, urban water quality uh, up to 2030 uh, with a biochemical oxygen demand in various places. Uh, by the way, uh, this is river flow, and here's ocean. Uh, this is highland, and according to the, uh, this figure. The lower uh, part of this river having higher, of course, you know, I mean, the concentration BOD. Uh, this is a, a, if there is no wastewater treatment plant as we uh, planned in the uh, master plan. Of course, this future has a one of alternative of the future, which we can change uh, if we uh, work hard in order to maintain their quality better. This is a summary. Uh, water pollution is going to be bad. Flood area is going to be worse. And with this combination in, in, in the flood, uh, polluted water in the, in the flood, with the, with the flood, and we have more chance having a interaction with wastewater, which has a high concentration pathogen in it. Which is a, now uh, we are also uh, thinking in the coronavirus uh, situation. Yeah, you can access, you know, uh, this, this website uh, and you can download some of the map, uh, not all, uh, uh, for we did, a twin, uh, we did around 10 cities in Asia for flooding, uh, uh, flood damage, uh, water quality, and value of water, which is uh, uh, also we did a, an infection disease and local port and wastewater treatment. So uh, you can you can see and uh, what kind of the work we did in the in the past. Uh, this is a new uh, just we I picked from the New York Times, uh, uh, which was in, in May first. Uh, new coronavirus is found in the feces. Um, it's infected in the throat, but it regrows in a s uh, small intestine. And in New York and in Paris, you know, also in one uh, uh, in our article that uh, that we can make uh, wastewater as an indicator of the outbreak in the city. However, problem is the detection method is not established yet uh, for coronavirus. Uh, from wastewater. We don't know what the recovery rate of the coronavirus is. And sampling for raw wastewater is difficult. I, I, I'm gonna have a informal meeting with their, with their, their vice uh, minister tomorrow uh, in order to request to allow to sample uh, from the wastewater treatment plant in Tokyo. So wastewater treatment plant is now a centralized and decentralized combination. Uh, we have now technology. In the past, we cannot make the treatment in a small scale, but now we can do it. So centralized and decentralized combination. Then if we treat a, a treatment in a decentralized manner, then we can recycle the water at that point. If we recycle water, we use a less small amount of water, smaller amount of water, and that uh, result in the small amount of the wastewater discharge into the environment. And water environment, you know, optimize uh, quality uh, of life and resident and tourist uh, design, landscape, and other function, utilize groundwater for water resources, uh, minimize health risk. Asian city, this is the last slide of mine, uh, is a sustainable city uh, with adequate and 
equitable, equitable and affordable access to the water and sanitation, even for informal settlers. Uh, resilient city for future climate and urbanization. Uh, we have uh, uh, in Asia, we have a lot of too much of water in certain period of time, certain period of the of the season. Uh, however, it's uh, it's very ironically we also have a shortage of water in the urban area. Low carbon city through the integration of water management, innovation, and technology. Low carbon also means that we don't depending on their fossil fuel, which is high intense intensive, their energy intensive water, I mean their uh, water treatment. Scientific knowledge is very important. Uh, this is our role of engineering scientists, uh, need for scientific based policy making and urban planning. However, we also have to understand that uh, we should know that science can describe only a part of the phenomena. Uh, we should not be so uh, optimistic. Science can describe everything. Uh, which is that's why you know I mean there I also run Future Earth in Japan. Uh, we have to have science and practitioner and users in all kind of the stakeholder have to work together in order to fill the gap between science and reality. Thank you very much. Uh Dr. Kensuke, thanks very much for your info, uh, for presentation. We, we had the chance to see some water dominant situation, uh, hear about the water related situation from the perspective of Asian cities. Um, so far, uh, we are go, uh, doing very well uh, with time. So we are well on time. Um, I would like to now wrap up the presentations and then move to the discussion part afterwards. But just before that, I have a little, a, a small question for you. Sure. How do you envision the future of cities where the nature is like the boss in the planning and the design of the city itself, like the society becoming uh, hands in hands with the nature. So considering the high urban population and the limited resources, um, how would you optimize the future in, in, in which aspects? Thank you, uh, it's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, the most of Asian country is a too democratic, except China. I mean, there, for example, India is very democratic. That means their government is not be able to control. And as a, uh, in, in, in Bangladesh or, or, or Philippines, uh, activity of NGO is quite useful. The reason is government is not functioning. That means they're uh, long, uh, but at the same time, uh, government, uh, is there, you know, having a political cycle of four or five years, that we also is not really uh, suitable for long-term visioning. Um, so I'm not really answering the question. However, I think there are transparency and uh, democratic way with their frequent discussion uh, to plan long-term is very important, but uh, this long-term plan have to be redesigned every period, like five years from the viewpoint of adaptation. I think adaptation from climate, uh, climate change is not really showing their alternative for the future, but uh, to think uh, the system to reconsider, to reevaluate the plan is important. Uh, from the viewpoint of that, you know, I think the Stefan, you know, the citizen participatory our science is very interesting because government is functioning. And if you see the Hanoi water quality, Red River, five years, there's a you know, everyday measurement because CEDA give a project. And after eight years, no measurement, zero measurement. And then, you know, FINIDA give another project and then start measuring it. So this is citizen participatory is very good because if we have this and if you stick some sensor, which, and then, data is somewhere, you know, and still citizens may get there a huge opportunity for IT company 
government even uh, for this. So with this kind of open manner of their communication and I mean, the, and, and, and citizen also can change uh, by seeing this data can change uh, this proactive, you know, uh, uh, pro environmental, act, I mean, their uh, behavior, they can improve their behavior. So this kind of open, transparent, and, and democratic manner of the governance is very important. Right, indeed. And there are many different cultural, political uh, diversity within the whole context. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I would like to thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation. It was very insightful and we will get back to you and uh, the other two speakers during the discussion part. Before moving to that, I would like to uh, inform the participants where we are uh, we have exceeded 400 uh, may reaching around 500 so this is excellent and uh, there is a great variety uh, so we have people joining us from across the globe and uh, one question uh, coming from many of the participants is the availability of presentations so um, at the session page, you can uh, access the uh, presentations. Uh, they are downloadable. Um, and there are two of them are not there yet, but they will be. So keep an eye on the session and the symposium page. OK. Um, so uh, we had excellent uh, talks from our invited speakers. I would like to thank them for joining us today and sharing their insights insights on the, the SDGs, uh, UN SDGs agenda. Um, I think uh, we can move to the discussion part now. Uh, our uh, speakers have been answering some of the questions through the Q&A box, but we still have some unanswered ones. Uh, just before, I would like to say one more thing just to give a perspective uh, based on the whole uh, uh, discussions we heard so far and my own perspective included. So the earth is, uh, let's consider it as a being like us and we are learning how to live together with it and living inside as the societies where there is a great diversity in terms of um, political, economical uh, and many more uh, contexts. It's um, really challenging to learn how to uh, deal with these aspects while creating an environment where uh, all the STGs are met in a uh, preferably a full extent. We have 10 years left and as the geoscientists coming together every year, once a year, uh, uh, within the roof of EGU, this symposium uh, aimed to uh, increase awareness on how um, we can contribute, how we are actually contributing and how we, we should continue further. Um, and in this respect, being the doctors of Earth, trying to underst understand how it functions and while this functioning continues, how the society relates to this functioning and how we impact, uh, so there, there is a great span of uh, disciplines that involve the um, achievement uh, of H SDGs. And as geoscientists, um, we have a lot to do, okay? <laughs> and uh, we hope that this session uh, gave you the, opportunity to, to think about how you can tailor your mindset, your projects, your research goals 
within the framework of uh, SDGs. After 2030, uh, we might, we will probably have a, a, a new framework. So this will not stop, it will continue. And we hope that as geoscientists, we will uh, do our best. Now on to the discussion part. I would like to uh, pass uh, the floor to Julia Roder. She's joining us from somewhere in Asia. Thanks. <laughs> Julia? Thank you. Um, I have a question for Juliano, but I think it's going to be a very good even for uh, Kensuke, because uh, our uh, guest is saying that uh, we are in the need of long-term perspective and solutions. Uh, so from a social science perspective, this can be modeled, but uh, he um, is asking whether we can model also socioeconomic uh, trends uh, to include even the economic part as you Giuliano were mentioning and also Kensuke that even the economic part is really much important and somehow difficult to, to predict. So how, uh, if you can both briefly answer to this question? Yes, um, so very briefly uh, is that, I mean, it, modeling the socioeconomic part is nothing new. We have been doing this for decades and we are doing it. What is what is done more and more is uh, to explicitly model the uh, also the, the way in which human behavior and decision making process can change over time and um, have an influence on the long term. Clearly, since we have social processes involved, uh, these models don't, don't have a predictive power that you would expect for systems that are completely under control. Uh, but you can still use them to analyze uh, plausible scenarios. And uh, I also agree with Kensuke what he said before. I mean, when we, when we think about long-term, we think about long-term perspective. So uh, in my slide, for instance, I say that we have to be careful about short-term decisions that can constrain our decision space in the future. So clearly we always need to adapt. So decisions can be taken, but the problem is that we, there are some decisions that we can do today that will limit the decisions we can take tomorrow. So that's important to keep the, you know, the, the space of possibility in the decision uh, of decisions uh, broad so that we can keep on adapting. Thank you. Kinsuke, yeah. do you have uh, yes. yes, I projected the uh, water quality of the 2030, but uh, I have a big <laughs> question mark on it. <laughs> because with water quality is really depending on their um, you know, economy or population of the urban and urban population projection is usually is not really is good. <laughs> Accuracy is not really good. Um, uh, however, uh, you know, I mean, there uh, now current project actually GDA is also part of it. You know, uh, we model entire economy and uh, each sector uh, and and what is their uh, demand of water uh, and what is their uh, quality of wastewater and what is their uh, demand of their uh, water environment and then how much uh, investment we have to put into the each sector uh, for the wastewater treatment. I think there are, uh, uh, by modeling this economical system, uh, we cannot make a long-term projection. However, we can do like a few years, uh, uh, you know, I mean the uh, future of the projection. Um, and the methodology itself should be maintained. This is basically input out of table uh, you know, based uh, analysis. Uh, so, I mean, there, our role probably that we, we develop a tool methodology and the result is subject to, uh, to evaluate uh, every couple of years. Thank you very much. I have another question for all of the panelists. Um, there is a researcher claiming that um, the um, SDGs, so the one related to climate change, shouldn't be just an indicator, um, but like a goal, but should be like the first to be considered because climate change actually is like um, at the top um, of all the SDGs because everything is connected to that. Uh, what's your take on that? If you have any, any thought, maybe we can start from Stefan. 
Yeah, I think this is a is a, actually a very good suggestion to some degree. I I also said that at the beginning where maybe it's your, when I was asked about the indicators. So the indicators are currently seen more equally, but I think we should really look at the big transformations needed and the biggest transformation needed. Uh, I would really see with respect to climate change. So we need to prioritize and and climate change is one of the i would say climate change be, be, besides inequality these are the two most fundamental uh, uh, issues we have currently um and it relates also a little bit um about on what you just currently said about the shorter term and the longer term uh, uh, decisions are being made so policy makers are making decisions short term because they want to be re-elected. This is the biggest problem we have because what we are measuring, we are measuring GDP mostly and that's what they are measured against because that relates to unemployment and as we know if GDP is high and is doing well, the economy is doing well, unfortunately Trump will be re-elected. Now he has problems because of COVID he would probably have most been likely been re-elected now he has problems. But we are measuring the wrong thing. So we need to measure policy makers against other measures, which are measures, uh, indicators which relate to the environment. And we need to put climate change first and other things second. And that is a very, very difficult and complicated process. But we need to start with the prioritization and with, with certain ways how we measure things. So very good suggestion. Thank you. Um, Giuliano? Yes, um, I think it is a good point to go to the essence of our, our uh, uh, perspective and indeed uh, different people can think about different aspects and uh, the, the, the main SDGs show that there has been a negotiation about uh, different goals. From my point of view, uh, which is subjective, uh, the key goal is to uh, have a physical, mental and social well-being of any inhabitant of this planet. And this implies fighting poverty, inequalities, and indeed uh, the threat of climate change. And, uh, and then we can discuss, but I also agree with uh, what Stefan said about we, maybe also this COVID crisis can give us the opportunity to stop bothering too much about the GDP growth and think about uh, you know, our well-being in a holistic way. So not only you know, well-being as the absence of a disease or absence of the virus, but as a physical, social and mental well-being. So that's, that's for me is the driving goal. Indeed. Um, Ken? Um, yes. I, I make a little bit different framing, you know, I mean, the biggest change uh, that we have to prepare against climate change is that we have to are uh, a very different source of energy now, and we have to use it. And that will uh, make our, our entire producing system, social system, economical system, totally, we have to change it. I mean, there, in the past, and you know, we need a big, kind of very high density energy source in order to make, to, to run big wastewater treatment plant. Um, it's con it swallow around 5% of the energy, total energy demand of Japan. And, but we don't need that kind of high density water if we have a decentralized way, manner of the, uh, you know, I mean the wastewater treatment. And we need a very small, like one square meter of solar panel in order to treat one household wastewater. Um, uh, nobody has invested uh, for this. I mean, they're in their uh, Earth Day 22nd, you know, the they're Secretary General of the United Nations having a short video, uh, highly recommended to watch it. And he said that he, we have to stop investing wrong place of, of in, the, in, the, in, the, in the energy. And that is a huge opportunity for industry. So uh, government does not have power. People does not have power after uh, even after this, this corona um, virus, you know, and the outbreak. And uh, we also have to, uh, depending on their uh, work with their the investors, uh, industry, uh, and we have to make a win-win approach uh, to make it. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, I have a question that may take some of the comments here. So when we speak about uh, we, sustainability and development, we used to have a very broad perspective, but then if we look at single culture or city instead of rural communities or some continents, we might face differences. And so we may also apply uh, different measure, different indicators um, to measure the same uh, approach or the same development. So um, some of the researchers also argue about some countries may have resources, some other have not, and may also use uh, short-term or long-term solutions um, differently according to what they can do. Uh, do you have any opinion on all these different cultural, economic and um, uh, problems we have? Uh, well, if uh, maybe I can start, but I, I guess, uh, yeah, this is, um, uh, it's a, it is a common question and uh, at least I can speak uh, mainly from a natural hazard perspective. Uh, typically, in, when we manage, you know, crises or emergencies, we always say that there is not a one size fit all solution. I mean, there, there are no universal solutions, and uh, uh, and everything has, is context specific. Uh, any type of um, the the type of measures that you can put in place depend on the uh, social cultural context as well as in the demographic conditions and the various aspects. Uh, so absolutely. Uh, what what is being done with the SDGs, I think, is to open up a global discussion, and uh, there is a value in this because, as I said before, it is uh, it is it is nice if if as humanity we can agree on the general principles. Then how this then uh, translate to each context? It has to be discussed locally. It cannot be decided uh, top down from you know from uh, from the UN uh, to to the to the local scale. Thank you, Stefan. Do you have a clue on that? Yeah, yeah I, I agree very much with what has been said, but the issue is clearly indeed around the indicators and what I am seeing and what will, will happen is that you can measure these indicators in, in different ways. And, um, you know, there are certain uh, indicators so like for example forest area right um, where sometimes in some countries oil palm is is counted as a forest uh, even though that's not true but it, it appears on remotely sensed data mostly still as a forest so it depends a lot on on what you measure how you measure it and 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 this is a little bit of it of the danger that each country will try to show off and slightly modify uh, the way something is measured to to the country's advantage um so um this this is this is i think is is some challenge we we are facing um uh, but also we maybe we, we shouldn't make a contest between countries and in, in trying to show off maybe we just need to change change their mentality that they are openly and honestly and transparently reporting so it has been already mentioned but i think Transparency and openness, I think, is a very important component of, of, of all these this, this, this processes. Oh, uh, yes. Um, yeah, local, I mean, the localization of SDGs is very important for many actions. And of course, you know, these localization SDGs have to be really based on their culture, uh, their history, uh, their uh, industrial com composition, and the level of investment and development. And this is uh, 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 very important, you know, the openness and, I mean, the, and transparency is for, especially for their um, investors. Um, it's, it's very important uh, in order to respect the culture. Of course, you know, I mean, there, we have to think about inclusiveness when in the outside, you know, investor invests something to the, to the region. Uh, Elena Olstrom, you know, I mean, there, the, the, you know, there's a few, few risks <laughs> that she made. We have to be really careful with, her, uh, with the local condition. Um, but I have one problem, you know, especially there, uh, as in related to the Stefans, you know, I mean, there, uh, this citizen participatory approach, we 
are like a Miss Greta, uh, you know, I mean, they're uh, also, I mean, they get upset with our physical condition of the earth. But it's, uh, we don't have that kind of rule in the cyberspace. In the data, uh, people can make use of their citizen participatory data and can manipulate it. I mean, there or some people uh, just, you know, uh, act, I mean, there does not make this data open. And then, uh, for example, I mean, the, we, I mean, in China, uh, if I'm the president of the IT company, I can identify clean water place. Then we sell we sell this information to the to the industry and build some 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 you know I mean there are factories there, uh, or we find out some clean, uh, polluted you know air uh, place. Uh, then we don't want to sell ins life insurance to that kind of city because it is bad you know. So I, I don't know how to manage this kind of you know. We don't have a good rule and good you know I mean their management skill of the cyberspace yet. Stop. I, sorry, I changed the subject maybe. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, there is a question that is for uh, Ken, but I think it's going to be for everyone. It is quite interesting. So these researchers for Philippines is arguing that um, sometimes um, government and NGOs can work together. So there are synergies uh, among these public bodies um, and NGOs, but they um, are far short in meeting the SDGs. So um, the researcher is asking whether and which is the role of scientists uh, to look at, find out new solutions or how we can better, uh, you know, uh, enter in the, in the dialogue within them and make a change, if you have any insight or experience. Um, yes, um, I think that our scientist role is there very important. For example, I have been working in the water pollution area for the last 30 years. No governmental director worked for same field for 30 years. Usually director change every three years, two years. And president or prime minister in our case changes you know, every few years. Uh, Abe is a little bit longer than others, you know. <laughs> but there are our role is to bridge between new director, a continuity of the policy. Uh, that is, I think, the one of the role, not all entire role. So, uh, uh, and we, uh, our main product of university faculty is a student. I mean, not the actual research output, in my opinion. You know, then we have we. I mean, that we by uh, you know we have a lot of supporter in order to continue this kind of the inertia of their, uh, you know, uh, policy, which we believe it is uh, true. But we also have to be the true, is we have to uh, decide it's not only by us, but with the many stakeholders. So our uh, role is a continuity of the policy. Thank you. Julian or Stefan, if you want to take the stage. Yeah, I, I think uh, I agree with what, um, what was just said. Um, I think there is also some a responsibility for scientists to engage with with policymakers. I think this is really important, and I think if we want to have an impact as scientists on the world on improving the world, we need to engage. That that, that we need to get into a dialogue with the policymakers, and it's about a two way uh, a, a two way communication, uh, and we need to also understand the policymakers more. Uh, in order to to know what what prescription for the planet we give to the to the policymaker is best. But just to come back to what you said about companies, and I agree with you, working also with companies and 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 you know making sure the investments of companies owning most of the money besides some foundations uh, uh, where we are not sure yet if if that they are completely free of interest. Um, if if the companies are working closer with 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 scientists, that is critical. Um, also, there is the opportunity to work with companies um, to that they can open up their data. Because as we know, without good data, we cannot really understand where we are going. And companies do own massive amounts of data. Scientists could potentially play a role in facilitating the so-called 
pre-competitive space for discussion about opening up data sets. I think this is a very interesting field. Um, some companies are prepared to actually open up their data if the other companies are also doing it. If all agree, we need uh, that. Uh, so that's happened with COVID now with, with Apple and, and, and but we don't need a disaster for that. We need, uh, or COVID, we need, some, we need this in principle as a, as a way forward, forward you said to treat, to treat the planet and to, so this is a discussion with, which, which is a very interesting and important one. Thank you. Yeah, this is also answering the last question about how to engage industries on SDGs and I think it's transparency and, and cooperation. Um, so if Juliana would like to answer and then we are gonna wrap up. I can, uh, I can be very brief because I see time is running out and, uh, and maybe also others like me have other <laughs> meetings at 12.30, but uh, I agree with what was said so far. And uh, we need to engage if we want our science to have an impact. Of course, we can also just enjoy science as, uh, as scientific curiosity, but if we want to have an impact, we need to engage. Uh, what we are doing, uh, for instance, in the field of natural hazards is to is to work indeed with both the public and the private sector. And uh, at this dialogue, as it was already said, it has to be two ways because uh, we also have a lot uh, to learn. It's not uh, scientists telling uh, policy makers or decision makers what to do, but rather it's a, it's a co-production of knowledge. And uh, this is also the way in which science advances. Thank you. Nilay? Yes. I'm amazed with the questions and the responses given by our speakers. We can continue talking more and more. There is no limit to the things that we need to discuss, but we have to end uh, the session, uh, our beloved symposium in three minutes. So I would like to uh, thank our speakers uh, for being here with us today and sharing their insights. It has not been easy to really set up this at this difficult, challenging time, but we really appreciate their willingness. Uh, it's very valuable. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the amazing uh, efforts put my by my colleagues, Jonathan Ritzi, Gabriela Nobre, Chiara Marquina, and Julia Roder, who uh, uh, directed the discussion part today. Uh, the planning has been going on for a very long time, and it was still ongoing until one, two days ago. So uh, it's been a really a good experience for us too, and we hope that the symposium had reached its uh, objectives. Uh, you can uh, reach to us uh, or our speakers via uh, our personal emails. Uh, the, the presentations will be available on the symposium page. And um, yeah, um, the geosciences will, be, be, will become more and more prominent in the coming years. It's gonna be more popular because we need it, we need it a lot, and uh, we hope to bring the discussion forward in other uh, platforms in the next few years. Uh, so thanks for joining.